hello and thanks for joining us here on Encore. Coming up on today's show. ¿Tiene algún problema con eso? A fantastic woman and a transgender trailblazer. We meet the actress spearheading a social shift in Chile. A contemporary take on some of the lost treasures of Iraq. Exhibition Baghdad Mon Amour revisits the city's cultural heritage. And a stroll around one of Impressionism's most memorable landscapes, we take a look at Claude Monet's garden in the springtime. We're starting with a film that made a splash at this year's Academy Awards. A fantastic woman scooped the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. With it, Daniela Vega became the first transgender actress to step up to that high-profile podium, and the prize has created shockwaves across Chile, where the film was made. Time magazine now named Vega one of the year's 100 influential people, and activists are campaigning for a law to defend transgender rights in a country where Catholic and conservative outlooks have often set the tone. France 24's Laurie Fechel and Gideon Long got a rare opportunity to sit down with Daniela Vega herself. My name is Marina Vidal. Tiene algún problema con eso? A transgender person, discriminated against, humiliated by the Chilean state, for whom changing sex is a real challenge. This is the story of Marina in the movie, of Daniela in real life, the first transgender actress to present on stage at the Oscars ceremony, and the heroine of the Chilean film, A Fantastic Woman. We meet the actress in Santiago, in this cafe where she often spends her time. For her, a fantastic woman is also her own story. Anyone can be Marina. Anyone can be discriminated against, rejected, pushed to the edge, just because they're different from other people. I've suffered discrimination by the state, by the police, and also in medical centers. I couldn't go to university, for example. I'm self-taught. I cannot study because back then, trans people weren't allowed to. The team that made the movie has been welcomed by Michelle Bachelet. Two days after the film won the Oscar, the socialist president said she would make one of her top priorities, the law that would change the civil status of trans people, unsuccessfully. The right has returned to power, with Sebastian Piñera as president. The law has been modified. But with the success of the movie, the trans rights associations are more active than ever. Of all the sexual minorities, the trans population is the most vulnerable. At any moment, they can be kicked out of their homes or even killed. The Chilean state has to get up to speed with the rights of the trans population. The film has been in cinemas in Chile for more than a year, a record. Extra viewings have been put on. The movie hasn't left people indifferent. I can identify with Marina because I think she suffers all the same discriminations that we women suffer. I like the film, although I didn't like all the feelings it generates. The impotence and the frustration faced with all this discrimination. Faced with these injustices, other actors have become active. Like Katy, to raise awareness of the violence suffered by trans people, she appears in this campaign clip produced by an NGO. Trans people feel isolated and rejected. They risk death because of what it means socially to be trans, because of all the obstacles they face, the lack of support from the state and the lack of understanding from society. While they're waiting for the law to be voted on, Katy Kovalesko, Daniela Vega and others continue their careers and their fight for the rights of transgender people in Chile. Latin America is the region with the highest murder rate of trans people in the world. next and an exhibition which revives the ghosts of the past and seeks to leave an artistic trace for the future. Baghdad Mon Amour explores both Iraqi history and the country's reconstruction after decades of war. 
Featuring the work of 17 contemporary artists, it's a love letter to lost artifacts and forgotten traditions. Georges Yazbek and Erin Agunke headed to the Institute of Islamic Cultures to take a look. Archaeology, ancient architecture, and even calligraphy. The exhibition Baghdad My Love makes use of a panorama of artistic styles to reconstruct Iraqi cultural heritage, much of which has been destroyed after decades of war. The 17 contributing artists want to recreate Iraq's once thriving art scene. These artists behave like archaeologists, archaeologists from the future, not only from the past. I think it's necessary to bring artists from different generations together with all of their different approaches to reconstruct the visual culture that Baghdad once embodied. With his letters to Ishtar, Iraqi artist Himat takes a look at the country's origins. Through poems written to the goddess of Mesopotamia and central figure of the Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian empires, he's created a work of collective art. It's a project I started almost 18 years ago. I called on seven poets to write a letter to Ishtar. To me, Ishtar is a symbol of Iraq, femininity, and of land as well. Land where art, until recently, was a target of Islamic extremists, who controlled various regions of the country, including Mosul, shown here in 2015. The two wars in the 90s and the 2000s destroyed a significant part of Iraqi cultural heritage. This is what inspired Julien Hulbert, the only French artist taking part in the exhibition, to imagine the reconstruction of a fragment of the door of the ancient site of Babylon. I read a newspaper article about the transformation of Babylon into an American military camp. I was interested in this idea of rebuilding a famous archaeological site which has already been moved in the past, from Babylon to Berlin to the Louvre. So there's already this idea of relocating things, and so I wanted to rebuild it with military bags. In the 1950s, Iraqi artists moved into the Archaeological Museum of Baghdad to take inspiration from Islamic, Sumerian, and Assyrian antiquities. Now, almost 70 years later, the exhibition Baghdad My Love is bridging the country's artistic past and present. It might just be the sweetest season here in the French capital. Springtime in Paris has been one of the warmest on record this year. Tourists and locals have taken that opportunity to visit a celebrated garden outside of the city, Claude Monet's former home in Giverny, which inspired the painter's iconic water lily canvases. Alexander Orcott has this report. Claude Monet settled in Giverny with his family in 1883, and over the next 40 plus years it inspired some of his most famous paintings. The father of Impressionism discovered the village some 80 kilometers from Paris while on a train ride. He found it provided the tranquility, light and colors he was looking to express in his art. Ten years after settling with his family, Monet had raised enough cash to buy a piece of land. The garden he created has become an artwork in itself and thousands of people visit each year. Last year, we set a new record, receiving 637,000 visitors over seven months. This makes the Claude Monet Foundation in Giverny the most visited place in Normandy, after the Mont Saint-Michel, of course. The garden comes in two parts that contrast and complement each other. In front of Monet's former home is the flower garden, known as Clos Normand, with its archways of climbing plants. While on the opposite side is his Japanese-inspired water garden, complete with its famous bridge. 
Monet did not like it to be too organized or constrained. He clumped together different varieties of flowers by color and let them grow freely. It's an effect that the new head gardener will try to reproduce. It's the garden of a painter and an enthusiast. There are no clearly defined rules. You have to have a certain artistic sense and a lot is just done on instinct actually. Some of the plants and the techniques have changed. But what's important is to keep the mindset of what Monet would have liked in his garden. If you'd like to visit the garden, its gates are open every day until November. We're finishing with a look back at the images of a celebrated member of the Magnum Agency. Abbas has died at the age of 74. The Iranian-born photographer was best known for covering the major conflicts of the late 20th century with iconic shots from Vietnam, Cuba and Northern Ireland. He also covered the uprising in his own country during the revolution, an undertaking documented in the book Iran Diary, 1971-2002. to 2002. Abbas called himself a photographer with a writer's spirit. We'll leave you with some of the best of his imagery. Do remember to check out our website and you can keep up with us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.